The Floor Academy podcast is sponsored by Trelama, the trade labor marketplace, where businesses can find skilled trade labor, such as flooring installers, and where flooring installers and other skilled tradespeople can find permanent or project work. You can set up your profile at trelama.com, T-R-A-L-A-M-A.com, or download the app from the Apple App Store or Google Play. And remember, Trelama is always free for skilled tradespeople. Welcome to the Floor Academy podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Hedin, owner of Illustrious Hardwoods in Phoenix, Arizona. We're here talking with flooring professionals from all across the country about the issues that matter to you. This week's guest is Ron Nash. Ron is the Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing of North America for Lady Crete International. He spends his time with us today discussing how a lack of professionalism in the industry as a whole affects the money you're making. Listen in to find out how you can change your mindset, learn to grow, and become more successful whether you are an employee or managing the sales and marketing for North America. Ron Nash, are you on the line? I am on the line. Hello. Awesome. Welcome to the Floor Academy podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I think we got something special here planned for everybody. Uh, Lots of insights to come. So why don't you go ahead, introduce yourself, a little bit of background, how you are involved with the flooring industry, where you got started, where you're going, what you do, things like that. Sure. I'll give you the, the real quick version of it. So uh, Ron Nash is my name. I'm the Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Latacrete. Um, that means that I'm responsible for uh, sales, marketing, product development, technical services, um, you know, strategy, innovation, those kind of things for, for the company, um, for North America. So my, my area of responsibility is the United States and Canada. Um, how do I, how did I start there? Well, my, my background is always been in, in construction. I've, my jobs that paid me money over the years have always been in construction, uh, general contracting. My family was in general contracting and I, I also became a general contractor. I, um, went into commercial contracting. I always say that, uh, I'm a recovering general contractor. Um, my, I have a natural sciences, uh, uh degree, um, uh, but, but I'm, I'm always been made a living in contracting. So, so I've, you always fall back to what you know and what you love. And, and just so happens that the Laticretes, you know, brought me into the flooring industry and um, it's been great. I've been with Laticrete for, well, a little over 15 years, almost 16 years now. So okay. um, there you go. And there's, uh, you, you said you had one degree, um, so you got the general science, general sciences. Yeah, I, have, I actually have a, I have a couple degrees. I have a degree in botany, and I have another one in forestry. Um, and I'm currently in a, enrolled in a program at Yale right now um, for executives and um, studying global leadership. And so it's like a business studying business, studying how to lead corporations, studying how to um, do all, all kinds of things, you know, get loads of people to uh, enjoy what they do and and uh, make an impact on the world. That's what I'm trying to study now. <laughs> all right. So just for fun, real quick, get botany to relate to the business of people. <laughs> you know what? You'd be surprised. I'm sure I, I, I would not be. <laughs> <laughs> there is there is many times when I've looked at financial models and I've looked at uh, market data and I've and I've thought about how um, close to the natural world a lot of these things are and especially when you start studying um, things like predation and you start studying about survival of the fittest and and uh, mm-hmm. you know some some of those things that that exist across all all nature and um, you know, it also applies very readily and directly to business. And, and, and so it's always been very interesting, but I think the bigger part is that, you know, I learned um, to appreciate the scientific method. And I think that that's Mm. been very helpful is that you remain open-minded throughout, 
you know, your, your career and that you're, you're willing to, to ask questions that are uncomfortable and you're never satisfied with an answer. You're continually looking for um, a better way to solve a problem. And, and those things all uh, really apply directly to business and, and, and really have been great training for me, especially when a lot of what I do is um, learning and, and trying to learn fast. And, and so the one thing I will say that um, my education has helped me with is that, you know, learning things that are very complicated and learning quickly has been a, a, a benefit, you know, in my career, for sure. I like it. So now is the I, you bring up learning, which obviously that's one of the reasons why this podcast exists is I want guys to learn while they earn because it, it's hard enough to go to to put in an eight hour day and do estimates in the evening and whatever it is that they're doing. You know, you, we got families mm -hmm. and, and, and all sorts of stuff. So how has that it sounds like you've dedicated yourself to lifelong learning, which I think is is ultra important. I didn't do it for years and I'm just kind of getting on that bandwagon now. But how how has that been incorporated into your life and how do you make that happen? Yeah, so it's really interesting, right? So I look at life, um, you know, learning and, and those kind of things. It's almost like an arms race, right? So I have very talented employees and I have a very talented team of people that I work with. And I'm continually pushed by them. They're so smart and so good that I'm continually feeling like, hey, you know what? I need to continue to have my skills sharp so that I can stay, I can stay uh, conversant. I can stay uh, part of the conversation. And so I'm surrounded by really smart folks, and and that that helps drive me. Mm -hmm. But the bigger the bigger part is um, that I feel more comfortable when I'm learning. I feel like I'm not stagnant, and I feel like I'm I've got new ideas to try. And I think that, you know, especially when you start thinking about what's going on here in COVID, you know, and, and how that's disrupted all of us, um, you know, the one thing that I can say is that I've read more books. And, you know, even though I'm on, you know, many podcasts like this, or I'm on uh, conference calls or, or Zoom meetings and video meetings almost all day, in fact, all day, um, I still enjoy um, my routine, which is I wake up, I do 30 minutes of personal study. Um, I, I have a, um, Evernote, uh, that I've used for about, uh, you know, gosh, years and years. And I have continual notes that I'm taking on certain su subjects. I have assignments that I have for school that I have to read. I have, I have all those things, but that time of that day, that first hour of the day is really sacred for me. And, okay. uh, you know, and I've just had to to make sure I have the discipline to keep it because when I when I don't do that, I feel myself um, starting to worry about things more, and I and depression sort of slips in, especially on things that um, are out of my control. You know, take COVID for example. This is all out of our control. We didn't create this. It wasn't a bad decision that anybody made. You know, and it's easy in that environment to kind of kick back and and start throwing up your hands and saying, well, what was me? But through training and study, I can boil down these problems, right? And I can feel like I'm investing in myself with the knowledge it's going to take to lead my organization through it. Okay. And so that really is personally, that's the deal. That's my. So we got to, we got to continue to grow and we have yep. to set aside time. We have to intentionally make sure we're doing something for us and it, it's okay to be a little selfish is what it sounds like. Um, you know, my, my thing is I don't view it as selfishness. I view it as, I view it as a requirement when it's the first time you have someone else that relies on you. Um, you're required to, to, to do these things okay. in my opinion. And in fact, if you work in my company and if you were, you were part of my team, there are two things that I give every employee. One is a book called David Allen's Getting Things Done, which is basically a basic blueprint for handling a high volume of tasks in a way that, um, you know, is organized and structured. And then I, I expect that you would read that book and then apply principles in your life. But the second the second thing that I always do is, is uh, talk about routine because you've never met anybody who's successful without a routine. Mm -hmm. You just haven't, you know, when you, when you look at studying really ultra successful people, 
every one of them have some sort of routine. You will never hear about the guy who sleeps in, never studies, doesn't do any personal sacrifice, and yet, bam, there's a pot of gold. You've never heard that story because it doesn't exist. Uh, yeah. I, well, I mean, maybe somebody wins the lottery, <laughs> but how many people that win the lottery keep their money longer than a couple of years and don't go broke again? So, Or die. Winning yeah. the lottery is uh, dangerous. Yes, very much so. <laughs> um oh my gosh like so much we're we're what eight minutes in and there's already so much packed into that that's amazing (laughs) um okay so actual like we're not even to the main topic guys and gals like this is just conversing this is what happens when you converse with ron like it just nuggets of wisdom just keep spewing out it's amazing i don't know about that part uh i for me i this is just stuff is coming out left and right that we can apply and, and work towards. So, um, all right. Lots of guys and gals are not like myself or a Ken Ballen or a, a Luke Miller. There's, there's lots of guys out there that go and they bid their own jobs. They sell materials that they can get access to. And then there's guys that will want to go the route of subcontracting, whether it's through a workroom or a mom and pop shop whatever it's it, it's going to be but there's a there's a wage difference there because mm. there's obviously more hands in the pie when you're subcontracting sure um i have found it hard to work with a shop because i don't feel i will be paid what i think is a respectable wage mm. um how can guys and gals in that position get themselves a better rate what what do they need to do to get in a position to where they're going to feel this industry is actually taking care of them cares about them they can they can have a retirement um you know it's just some of those questions i see out there when i you know the stores rip you off you never get paid enough i'm going to be installing until i'm you know the day of my funeral and they, they put me, they have to close the casket, you know, just all those kinds of yeah, things come up. Right. So. Right. Okay. Well, interesting. So there, there's a couple things here. Understand that. Let me, let me preface anything I'm going to say with I'm in the cheap seats, right? Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't have to make a living this way, <laughs> but, uh, but I can tell you that I've, I've had this conversation a lot of times. Now, I mean, many times across the country. And, um, and so the the big thing that I would say, like if if I were speaking to you and you were my friend and you, you were confiding in me that you were worried about the future, is is number one, regardless of how you work, you are responsible for the future that you set up, regardless. Mm-hmm. And um, just mentally understanding that you will get paid exactly what you'll accept. And and by the way, that's the case if you were to quit your job and come work for me. You know, there's it is a fact you will get paid exactly what you're willing to accept. And that, that goes into um, a lot of things. So, so the first thing I would, I would counsel people is know your own numbers, know your own, um, know your own goals and numbers in your own future. And I think it's really helpful when people understand what their aspirations are. And the bigger part is what do those aspirations cost? Mm -hmm. And, and, and that might be, okay, so right now, today, I work for uh, Luke Miller, and I'm an installer for, for Luke, and he has a shop, and, and, um, and part of my, my deal with him is that he gives me a rate sheet, right? And yep. I have to install to that rate sheet. Okay, well, first, I, I would like to, to suggest that every scene, everything that you've ever seen about pricing or rate sheets or anything like that, all of the, life is negotiable. Okay. And it's really important to understand that if you know your numbers and you know how much money you, you need and then how much money you want, and then bigger part is how much money you aspire to in your career, then it's going to help you work backwards on opportunities and understanding what a good opportunity is and what a, what a bad opportunity is. Because what I find is that people wind up falling into things on accident and then they allow their lifestyle lifestyle to create a treadmill for them and then that treadmill they can never get off of 
And, and you hear this kind of in a, in language that sounds like this, I'm going to work this job till I die because I don't, I don't make enough money to get ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear it and people do say that. Um, and people, people immediately look for places that they are quote unquote getting ripped off. And I will tell you that a lot of times, um, it's not necessarily that they're being ripped off. It's just that they don't understand one, their numbers, how much money they need to bring in, how they, how they should capitalize their own efforts and, and how they can gain efficiencies. Even if you were handed me, for example, a rate sheet and you were a good shop and I wanted to work with you and that rate sheet, how do you know what's, what's realistic and what's not realistic? I mean, the, and then the areas that are unrealistic, which are possible are there, what would be your strategy to, to discuss with your potential partners, you know, how to improve that and solve those problems. Instead of doing that, I find people just kind of throw up their hands and then they take a, an attitude of like, well, I'm just getting ripped off. And uh, you know, that's just the way it's going to be. And, and what I would challenge people to do is flip that around in their head. One by becoming as professional as you possibly can. Meaning understand that you hold in the value chain one of the most, ex most one of the most important positions. You are actually a doer and a maker of things. And it is ultimately the doers and the makers of things that um, supply uh, the, what everybody enjoys. Right. So so the power position is real. And understand that one of the largest areas of, of weakness right now in our industry and areas that I'm concerned about are the availability of qualified labor. Mm -hmm. Right. And understand how I said that qualified labor. Yes. So so understand that being a doer and a maker of things and if you can exercise your ability to sharpen your saw to the point where you are qualified meaning you are doing the extra trainings, you're doing the extra uh, to make yourself different and set apart from, from the, what I call the knuckle dragging monkey that everybody can talk about. You know, the guy who just went to Home Depot, bought himself a, a QEP tile saw, and now he's a tile setter, mm -hmm. you know? So if you go on one, that person on one side, you need to be so far away from them in qualifications that, that a, a conversation with a shop that you may be, you may be working with sounds entirely different. Um, you know, run the numbers. Hey, I've worked with, I've worked with your rate sheet here and here are some things that are, that are damaging quality, or here are some things that, that won't work. And we wind up losing money on. And as your partner, I can't do that. You know, those types of conversations um, are uncomfortable, but if you're professional about them and if you have data to support what you're saying, meaning knowing your numbers, knowing how much is spent on every every deployment, know, knowing how much is made on every deployment, then you're coming to that conversation with a bulk of data and not just an opinion. Opinions lead to argument. Data leads to, okay, well, um, your, your rates here, they apply, you know, you're suggesting that they're including floor prep. You're suggesting that they're including these things. How, how are those numbers derived? Talk mm -hmm. to me about how you got to these rates. And then it becomes a back and forth. Oh, Hey, well, I didn't, I didn't uh, bid it like that, or I don't do work like that. This is how I would suggest you bid it. Yeah. And, and, and those are, you know, obviously I can game plan this conversation from a million different ways because we're talking about a hypothetical. Yes. But at the same time, I think it's important that, you know, just to just to sum up my basic thoughts are I will have any conversation with any partner of mine if they bring to me at least an effort to get data into the conversation. Opinions and conversations of money are very nice, but they lead to arguments and disagreement. Data is a great source of truth. Hey, look, on this last job or the last three jobs, I lost money in these particular categories. Okay. How do you feel about that? You know, and, and just listening back and forth and understand that, you know, 
all of the negotiation that would happen next is very similar to if you were to leave, go on your own and try to find clients that are that you're going to sell your services to directly, except for they're going to be squeezing you from a different angle. So negotiations is part of life. Yeah. Get ready for it. Uh, there's there's a key word in there. You used it three times and I find it fascinating. You said partner. Yeah. And, and that's such a different mindset than what I think a lot of people look at it as even yeah. even guys that are hired by a shop as an employee and they're not a subcontractor you have to partner with the employer to be successful like I I understand what you're saying there but can you expand upon that a little bit because I think it's a very yeah. it, it's a very key word I think and it's it's subtle yeah, it is subtle and you're right. And like I said before, if I were to give anybody advice, it would be number one, be the most professional organization in the group. If you can make yourself more professional, it means you're going to have to change your language. What what I mean by that is if I do work with, for you and it's multiple engagements, then we have formed a partnership of sorts. And so therefore I would start referring to that as a partnership. And um, it, if you if you are referring to it as a partnership, then it should make sense to the other person that you're you're talking with and sometimes negotiating with that profit is part of any good partnership. Profit is part of business, and it's something that you should learn to enjoy and not necessarily be a, ashamed of. Mm -hmm. And I find that the language that people use. Um, employee 1099. Oh, that, that, that can be a slang too, by the way. Oh, we're just going to 1099 them. Yeah. You know, and, and what does that mean exactly? I'm a 1099. What, what does that mean? You, you basically relegated yourself to uh, a contract employee that has no rights, no, you know, there's all kinds of falsehood that goes around that when in actuality, how you pay me and how I file my taxes really has nothing to do with our joint venture here and our partnership. So I would suggest that you inject that language and don't accept any, any sub alternatives. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my thought. But once again, it's a mental, it's a, it's a, it's a mental game that we're in. Um, if you're striving to be the most professional person in the room, then this language applies. And, uh, and I can tell you that it is a path to profit. Well, and now you're on to, uh, now you're on to professionalism and I, man, mm. I love my flooring brothers and sisters. I, this community has been absolutely wonderful to me. That professionalism point, that's a big thing. <laughs> I, I hate to say yeah. it, but the, the, you know, you yeah. can go hang out on the, uh, you just within the Facebook groups alone. There's sure. depending on what group you're in, to, you can see that there's kind of different classes of people because different groups have different rules and allow different behaviors and yeah. different conversations yeah. are allowed to happen in certain groups where some groups are building you up and other groups, you can post something and you will just get ripped to shreds. And there's yeah, never anything. It's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. It, unfortunate. It, it is. But it, so not only with that, but just in how we're we're blue collar tradespeople. We're yeah. we're knuckleheads. We don't know anything. And not that there's not really smart contractors out there. Like that's not what I'm saying. I'm just trying to make the stereotype because that does exist. Yeah. So so how do you get you know, this let's professional? Because like, I think where it's where a massive. Go? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a massive problem. I think what you're what you're talking about now is actually the Achilles heel to the, the genesis of this conversation. Um, I've been around tradespeople literally my entire life. So believe me, I've, I've known every stereotype that you could ever hear of from the pot smoking roofer to the uh, to the crazy drywall folks, which are always crazy for some reason, <laughs> and and to the to the uh, electrician who just makes messes on job sites. These are all stereotypes, right? Yeah. In the tile installer, what I've noticed is some people are trying to embrace the stereotype. When I I can actually tell you that I have 
friends who are tile installation companies um, that I've had with, with, without a doubt, some of the best uh, conversations professionally where we're talking about really deep business concepts and you sit there and go, wait, this isn't the stereotype that you're portraying. Right. Yeah. It's, it's the, it's the brand, right? It's the brand and the brand image of professionalism. And that is, it's a concern for me, to be honest with you, because I can tell you that the ones who understand that professionalism, the fit and finish of their business, meaning they make sure that the people are clean, well-shaven. I hate to say, you know, not well-shaven is a bad word, but you know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. A professional look, mm-hmm. a professional look. And by the way, that may be covered with tattoos and, and a huge beard. It doesn't matter. But the point is a professional look and effort towards professionalism. Yes. Um, I think that that's a huge problem because here's the thing. Without it, what happens is um, people uh, don't respect themselves. And that manifests itself in a lot of different ways. And it manifest, manifests itself in exactly what we were just talking about. If I'm not trying to be professional and I'm not trying to build a business and build a career, these are all these are all things that the symptom or the 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 um, what do you call it the symptom of of accepting rates that you shouldn't accept because they're not tenable for your profitability. That's all connected. I guess that's my point. It's all connected. And, yeah. and by the way, it's even connected to improving your knowledge. It's it's connected to what we were talking about before, which is, you know, your routine, your your personal study, your you're taking your your business to the next level. This is all connected to professionalism. Well, and I think the the takeaway I'm getting is that you're you're going even if you're I don't want to say just an employee, even if you're an employee at a shop and they have you on payroll and you're making your twenty five dollars an hour or whatever. Sure. You need to be professional and you need to think of your career path and consider what you're what you're doing. You're not just you have to get out of the mindset of I show up and I'm going to install this bathroom and then I get to go home or I'm just going to go stretch in this carpet and I get to go home. Whatever it is that you're doing for the day, it's not clock in, clock out. There's a whole mindset that's going to go with this to be able to get you from $25 to $45. Like you can get somewhere else. Listen, I, I'm going to tell you right now, tell me where it will hurt to take this mindset. Tell me where it will make you make less money. And I, and I will agree with you. Tell me where it will hurt your overall career. Mm -hmm. Whereas I can tell you, let's say I didn't look at myself professionally. I don't care about my, how I present. I don't, I don't care about how people view my brand. How can that hurt professionally? I mean, you know, sometimes you have to think of things in, in just as simple as that terms, right? Um, you know, it winds up being like when I see people fail in this business, it usually starts mentally. And I mean that it usually starts between their ears. Mm -hmm. And then eventually their pride comes into, into play, but it's not necessarily the pride that you think it's not the pride that I'm going to lift myself up and I'm going to do better. It winds up being the pride of, Oh, the world just needs to accept me for how I am. Listen, brother, I wish that was the case. I wish I could tell people that, that that's completely okay because uh, if that was the case and that really was uh, the way it was, then then um, I know a lot of people who are super talented, but for one reason or another can't get them get out of their own ways. Yeah. You know, and, and that's really what we're talking about. And, and I was fortunate enough to have a father who um, <laughs> had very strong ideas on the subject. Let me put it that way. <laughs> And, and, uh, had, and didn't accept, um, from, from me or my brothers, uh, anything else, but a forward thinking thought, you know? And, and I find that uh, when I look at 
how our industry is right now, um, the companies who are doing the best and the installers that I know that are doing the best, and I'm talking about people on the trade in the trades, the tra- and like the people doing the work. Mm-hmm. Okay, the ones that are doing the best are the ones who are who are uh, looking at the long scope and they're making these decisions. And by the way, sometimes the long scope means that you change companies. Sometimes it means that you go work for a more professional organization. Mm-hmm. It's just a fact. There are some organizations that actually um, foster not being professional. In that case, what I want everybody to do is kick back for a couple minutes. I do it every day, but if you kick back for a couple minutes and you say, am I heading the direction that I want to in life? And then work backwards to why that might be. Let me tell you, professionally speaking, that's usually where people fall down. You know, it's important. You know, you're right. It's important to have not just the mindset, but without knowing the direction where you're going and being yep. able to work towards it. And so you have to have an end in mind and what's helped me is I put my goals on paper now and there's somewhere that I can readily see them every day. So I can remind yeah. myself, Hey, look, I'm working towards this. Hey, here's the eight steps that are going to get me to this bigger goal. Where am I at? Yep. Can I check something off? Can I feel good about it? So yeah, that's, it. that's going to be huge. You you have to set yourself up to get where you want. You can't, Somebody, yeah. and I've, I've said it on here before, somebody that you can have all the ambition in the world. And for a long time, I had lots of ambition. I had great ideas. I, I knew, you know, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to make a lot of money. I'm going to have, be able to retire, blah, blah, blah. You need drive. You have to find something that's yeah. going to get you up off your butt and actually go be ambitious. Yes. 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 I can't agree with you more. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to. I'm going to go even deeper. All right. Look, I know a lot of people who don't have college degrees who are very successful. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that is not an excuse. So if you don't have an degree, if you don't have a degree, you don't have an excuse that doesn't apply. hundred percent. I know a lot of people who have had broken marriages who are successful. So guess what? Sorry. That's not an excuse either. I have a lot of, I know a lot of people who started businesses and failed with them multiple times before they got it right. So being in the middle of something that's not winning right now, that's not an excuse. That's not, it's not a death sentence, you know? So it all comes down to your mentality in developing a winning aspiration. Like, I can tell you that there are some people that it wouldn't matter. You can take, you could take these people from the career that they're in now, you could drop them into an entirely different career and they are going to grow where they're planted. They're going to figure out a way to make that successful. And a Mm -hmm. lot of times it has to do with just the winning mentality that, you know what? Hey, yes, I will. Yes, I will be able to do that. Yes, I will be able to retire. You know what? My goal is to make X, X number of dollars and I've worked backwards. I'm not I'm going to know how to do it. I use, you know, there's there's a great book. And I mentioned this the other day when we were talking, but there's a great book called Playing to Win. And it's a great way to think of strategy creation because really what we're talking about is strategy, okay. right? How do I create a winning strategy? Even though I might not be responsible for the strategy inside my company, you have a strategic focus in your life. The minute you say, I want a new F-150 or F-350 or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Your mind immediately starts to cascade a strategy behind it. Hey, this is how I could get this. All right. Well, now you're just using that same consideration for what it's worth on your on yourself professionally. So what is your winning aspiration? That's the first question. What's your winning aspiration? And the next part is, you know, what's the purpose? What, what do I want to do? What, what I think is in, in interesting to me. Right. Next part is, where will I play? Where am I? Go- where am I going to have the highest likelihood of success in my career? And if I'm not there right now, how will I get there? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, how are you going to win? That's, that's a big question. Like what's my value proposition? How, what skills am I going to add that make me more competitive than, than my, my nearest competitor? 
right? Um, so I think we were talking about you're into hard surfaces, right? Yeah. Um, you know, if you were looking at, if you were looking at this concept of a strategy cascade, I would be asking you, what do you what are you going to do to your skill set, to your offering? that is going to make you more competitive than the next person that would come and offer your services. You know, Mm -hmm. that's a really important thing because that becomes a competitive advantage. And even in a career where you work with someone else, you're in a competition. If you don't think I was in a competition to become the senior vice president of sales and marketing for later degree, you don't know how talent talented my organization is. I have, there are at least 10 or 15 people that could do my job probably better than me right now. So, so it really doesn't. So, so my point is, is it really doesn't matter. You're everyone is in competition. So if you're, if you're doing contract work for someone or, or if you're competing against another contractor to win another job, you're in competition. So what's your value proposition? What's, what are you going to have as an advantage? What capabilities you do you need in order to go the next step? Yeah. You know, and then finally, what are you going to be required to do in order to get there? And if you could answer those things, you can literally apply that strategy framework to anything. And it, and I find that it really works great. So well, take COVID, take COVID right there. Okay. You got a lot of people who are, who are like stunned birds. Some of your competitors right now are like stunned birds. They've never dealt with anything like this before. They don't, they, they really don't know what to do. All they know is that their phone is slowed or stopped ringing. That's it. And so this is where fear and panic start coming into an organization. And by the way, to some people's mentality, and I'm going to tell you why I don't, I'm not, I'm concerned about it, but I'm not afraid of it. One, I'm continually working on my talent. I'm continually trying to get better. I'm continually trying to get a better answer for the challenges that are coming down the road. Next thing is I can apply this same framework to where I want to be. And I look at everything that happens like this as an opportunity, not necessarily a negative happening, meaning, Oh, this meteor came of a virus and it hurt my business. Mm -hmm. Yes, it did. But it also gave me a real opportunity to look at my systems and processes and say, is there something I can do better here? When I, when this thing opens back up and it will open back up, I want to be better than my competitor. So I'm going to use this opportunity to knuckle down and make it happen. And that's what we've done. So, so when you, when you start looking at those things, it's, it's all connected. And and then you go back to your original question. How do you get better rates? There you go. I just gave you a 20 minute answer for it. And that's exactly (laughs) what I was going to say was, okay, so we need to up our professionalism. We need to talk with who's ever we're negotiating with as, as a partner, and we don't necessarily need to talk dollars. We need to talk what benefits we offer, what, what professionalism, what differences are we bringing compared to the next crew or the crew after that, because we're in competition with them. Why would they want to pay us more when they can have the next guy do it for 10 cents, 25 cents, a dollar, a yard, whatever it's going to be cheaper. So and, and then you brought up the qualified labor thing earlier. Yeah. And I, I that's something that we could talk about for hours, probably. And you're going to have the guys that Certainly. say it's, it's absolutely useless to go and be CFI, CTI and WFA certified. It doesn't it means nothing, blah, blah, blah. I have not. I've yet to hear, hear anybody say I lost a job because I was over certified for it. Uh, well, of course, but they also will say <laughs> that have, they won't I have, learn. A... I have heard people say I've won jobs because of it. So, you know. correct. And I've I've never heard anyone tell me <laughs> they've lost a job because they weren't certified. But that's yeah. I don't know that that's why they're going to tell you you lost the job. So, sure. I, right. Honestly, from that perspective of of being more professional, I've found it one of the best investments I've made. Like it cost me. I don't know, like 1200 bucks to go to Texas for a couple days and get a CFI certification. I technically I, I lost a couple thousand by not being in town and being able to do a job, I guess if I would have had one lined up, but what has that brought me? Because as of now, I get to say I'm the only certified flooring installer for hardwood laminate in 75 miles of my zip code. 
the only one. That's right. There so you go. That, that's a huge. Nobody else is me. I am the only one that takes continuing education in this aspect of the industry seriously. So automatically, I'm a step above what everyone else is doing. Hundred percent. So that there's the benefit. It's it's the relationships you build by meeting the people there because they're like minded. They're gonna be guys like me. They're gonna be guys like Ron. They're gonna be guys like Luke or Ken. The people that will spend money on these things are the ones you want to go and associate with, not the guy at the shop that's bitching about rates with you. That dude's not yeah. going to do anything for you. <laughs> yeah, and, and and listen, it, ultimately, it's the long game, right? It's the long scope. We know, we know, and I'm in, I'm in the science of it, but um, we know that buildings are changing quickly. We know that building materials are changing super quickly. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody wants to get paid like a doctor, but nobody wants to do the education part to get themselves to be a doctor. I've, I've noticed this. Okay. By the way, everybody wants to make as much money as a lawyer. When everybody says, everybody's always like, you know, name a career that makes a lot of money. And they always throw out these professional careers, yep. lawyer, doctor, all these things. Okay. Um, what if I were to tell you that if you were to apply the same effort in education and improving yourself – as a doctor does in order to do his first operation, then the rest of this equation will solve itself. I would. You got to start. You, you got to start looking at yourself as a professional. Once again, I go back to that as a theme, I guess, for this conversation. Mm-hmm. But every professional that you've ever talked to has continuing education. Every single one. When you talk to aircraft mechanics who make decent money, by the way. They have a, a, an enormous amount of continuing edu- education that they have to do. When you look at um, doctors, of course, lawyers, of course, architects have continuing education that they have to do in order to stay licensed. Mm-hmm. Okay. Why do you think that is? How do you stay on top of the rate of change if you're not continually educating yourself and investing in yourself as a professional to make yourself more competitive. And the bigger part is let's take the competitive part out of it better at your craft. That That's what it all, all goes down to. If you're, if you're investing in yourself to become better at your craft, then all of this competition uh, worry that I hear about all the time goes away. You simply can't compete with someone like that. Yeah. And by the way, you're competing in an era that's way funner than competing on price. I'm going to tell you because now you're starting now you're now you're competing on credential. That's an entirely different sale. And the bigger part is it leads to profit. There's a reason why there's a reason why people do it. Mm-hmm. And yes, it does. It cost a couple grand here. It might cost you three to 5,000 a year. Put that in the budget. Make sure you know that. Make sure you know that those are the numbers you're talking about. Yes, we spend more than three to $5,000 a year on every sales rep in education. I mean, by the way, you want continuing education? We we have continuing education efforts in every single position in our company, every single one. So that's part of being a professional. That's the, it's the bigger part. It's like this disconnect mentally that, that we have in our industry. That's what I want to fight. And I think that this conversation crystallizes it really well. Totally being with profession- you. Being professional – means that you're continually educating yourself Mm. and it costs money. I'm sorry, but it does. It costs money. It costs architects to do it. It costs me to do it. That's just part of being a professional. That's it. I agree. Um, I think looking at it as costing money is wrong. It, let's you're investing in yourself. It, it, it yes, absolutely. it costs, but it, it's an investment. It, you're going to see returns. If you're going to go drop, $5,000 on like some fancy IQ saw or you want to get an Ermate or S26 so you can do dustless tile removal and the thing costs you $2,200, you're going to have pricey rates to cover the cost of that investment, that tool that's going to do a better job, faster, quicker, make more money. Why can't you invest? What's wrong with investing in yourself? Go take a night class on business at the community college. Go to CTI or a CFI or NWFA class, whatever you want to do. Go talk sure. with the, the Uzine, Laticrete rep. Uh, what, pick a rep. 
go yeah, have them get a mentor. teach you something. Do something. <laughs> get a mentor. Get a mentor. Uh, you know, get involved. There's plenty of places, by the way. You got your podcast. You got Luke's podcast with Tile Money. You, if you just want to talk about business, there are outlets. This industry is great for that, by the way. We're great for that. Mm-hmm. You want to get friends? You want to get friends? Become friends. You know, I, I'm, I have friends with, with hundreds and hundreds of people. I get PMs all the time. Hey, what are you reading? What do you, what do you, you know, what book do you suggest? I want to learn about X. Mm-hmm. I have, I have libraries of books that I've suggested to people over the years and, and, uh, just starting, that's the bigger part. You don't have to spend the $5,000 on the training right out of the gate. That might not be in the cards this year. You might only have enough money to, Start by listening to audiobooks and getting a, getting a Audible su- subscription for what does that cost now? Thirteen bucks a month. I mean, you don't need to know? do that. The public library will give you free audiobooks. Oh, there you go. Okay, <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm saying with you. I'm just it doesn't. Saying, yeah, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be a huge investment, no. but it does have to start. And that's that's the difference between good and great. Is the people that are great start and they start often. They don't. They don't just. It's not a flash in the pan. They, they, they get a little bit of discipline. Mm-hmm. And by the way, every time I failed in life, I go back to why I failed. And it's always go back to rule number one is you lost discipline. Every single time. Um, there's a great guy that I met and he's got a great podcast. His name's Jocko Willink. He's a, he's a Navy SEAL. And one of, one of Jocko's things that he mentions in his trainings that he does in his events is – Discipline equals freedom. And it is a fact. Discipline equals freedom. That means being more disciplined than your competitors when you're getting prepared for a bid. It means being more disciplined with than your competitors when it comes to training and educating yourself. It means being more disciplined means, you know what, sometimes you got to wake up a half hour early in order to get that meditation session in or that or that planned education session in or or that means that you got to actually dis- discipline yourself to write things down for once mm-hmm. you know what even it's simple goals writing those things down is the first step of getting it done you know and and um man if we could get everybody to do these things it would make a big difference in our industry oh 100 percent. uh that name you mentioned jocko is that the rucksack guy or is he runs like a, jocko, a run it sounds jocko familiar owns a- yeah, Jocko owns a company called Echelon Front, and he has a podcast, the Jocko Willing Podcast. It's you know, it's dudes podcast. It's pretty hardcore. It's it's Navy SEALs and law enforcement people talking back and forth. But he does a leadership. Uh, Echelon Front does a leadership program um, that basically talks about you know how do you, how do you lead small teams to do great things, and, and I think they're great. By the way, they have a, they have a, a great. He's got a great series of books. One of them is called. Um, uh shoot <laughs> i'm blanking blank on it right now uh he's got a great leadership book hey let me look it up no the name sounds familiar it, like I, I i'm sure i I'm, i feel like i've heard it on another podcast i listened to he was probably on like an entree leadership or something like that which is through the the ramsey network so yeah 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 extreme ownership sorry extreme okay. ownership holy cow i can't believe i forgot that um, so Extreme Ownership is a great book. And and by the way, for people who like audiobooks, he he reads it himself and the guy sounds like <laughs> a man's man, I'm gonna tell you. So if if you're looking at a good a good primer and a good place to start, extreme ownership's fantastic. What I love about Jocko's leadership style, it which is by the way apparent in a lot of military training, especially special forces, is that you own every outcome. Every outcome is not thrust upon you you have participated in one way or another where you Mm -hmm. own that Mm -hmm. and i'm going to give you an example so let's say you lose money on a job someone ripped you off what part of that what part of that do you own were you not disciplined in your communication or could you have been tighter in your contract could you have been more forthcoming in your communication you know there's a lot of different things but what parts do you own so when you start thinking about you know, it's this concept of breaking out of a victim mentality where the world is thrust upon circumstances to you and taking control of it where you are in control. You own it. Extreme ownership. I own everything that I've done. And by the way, 
not only do I own the things that I've done, I own the things that my team has done. Mm. And in leadership, that has served my career very well because I've been able to lead small teams that turn into much larger teams and now that turn into hundreds of people. But every single time that something negative has happened, you've never hear, heard me blame it on someone else ever because somehow some way part of that was also my responsibility and it works for yourself personally in your life, but also as you're a leader in a larger organization. So I couldn't, I couldn't uh, suggest that book enough to people. Well, and I think um, you're, you're hitting on something else here when you're, you're saying, okay, we need to be more professional. We need to invest in ourselves and get, we need to do continuing education, which is seriously lacking in the trades for some reason. Um, we need to own our, our decisions. You have to give something up. There's going to be sacrifice. You can't keep watching yeah. the boob tube six hours a day. Like you, you've got to change your mind with the whole things about changing your mindset, but you've got to change it to give something up. Are you, are you going to, you know, give up an hour of TV so you can invest an hour in yourself through a book and educate yourself on something like where are you going to stop doing one thing so you can improve yourself with another? That's right. There's only so many, you know, so I don't wear an Apple watch. I only wear an analog watch and there's a reason for it. I like to watch those seconds, mm. <laughs> right? I like to watch that second hand go around. And I realize, you know, I, I, I've been deeply into stoic philosophy, uh, the works of Marcus Aurelius, um, you know, the, the writings of, of some of the early stoic philosophers. Mm -hmm. And the, the big thing that you have to understand is that you are not guaranteed tomorrow. Every second that clicks off is a second that it may be done. You could have a massive stroke in the middle of this conversation. So when you couple these concepts together, they create rocket fuel for your life. And th if there's anything I hate worse is, is leaders that talk in just unactionable hyperbole. And I want you guys to know we are not talking in unactionable hyperbole. I'm actually having a conversation right now that's very similar to the conversation I have to a person that first comes into my organization. Okay. This is actually a really interesting conversation now, how many of the similar things we've talked about so far, because first of all, you are in control, regardless of how out of control life seems to be, you're in control. When you, when you talk to people who have been imprisoned and put in solitary confinement, the one thing that they say that's the most challenging bit is to understand what part of their lives they can't control. And in some cases, when you talk to uh, to these people that are became survival, survived it and became very successful from it, mm -hmm. they talk about things like all I could control was that I was in control of my next breath. And that's what kept me driving through. And by the way, it's the same for us on a larger scale is that if you remember your death, memento mori, remember that you are not guaranteed tomorrow then it creates that sense of urgency on what you leave behind and your legacy. And then that helps you with a long scope. That long scope helps you then say, all right, I need to change the trajectory or the angle of my life. And there's where you start getting into, all right, I need to study people's routines. Mm -hmm. I need to study people's what do successful people do every day? And I need to make sure that I'm, I'm at least doing that to an acceptable rate of start. Right. So I want to be clear here. I never suggest that people go break neck. I never suggest that you say, well, tomorrow I'm going to wake up and I'm going to do an hour and a half of study. I'm going to run a half mile or, or I'm going to run a, a, a mile. I'm going to eat nothing but perfect foods. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, you know, you people get, you know, they, the art of the start is small. You say something like, for the next five days, I'm going to read 15 pages of this book a day. Yeah. And that's it. That's all my expectation. And by the way, when you accomplish that, you're on. 
now you're on. Now, after conducting that for a little while, exercising that discipline muscle, and discipline is a muscle, by the way, for sure. By exercising that, you get stronger. Then you get little bumps of dopamine, little bumps of dopamine that hit your brain that basically say, hey, man, or lady, (laughs) this is a good thing. You just did a good thing. You're on the right path. Mm. And you know what it feels like, man. Tell me, tell me you've never, tell me you've regretted working out. No one ever regrets working out. What they regret is how long it took them or how difficult it was to start. Right. And this is very similar, but it's a mental thing. I've read a book that's very difficult to read. You know, I, I've, I've read those books and in the very last chapter, I go, wow, look at this. I just plowed through that whole thing. <laughs> and you get this bump of dopamine. I'm doing something. I'm investing in myself. Yeah. Well, and I've heard it like I, I've heard a story of a guy that was like super out of shape, really large. And he didn't even start by going to the gym to work out. He said, I have to get there. I'm going to go inside. I'm going to stay there for five minutes. And that's all he would do. He'd drive to the gym. He'd walk inside and sit there for five minutes and he'd walk out. But it built the routine to go. And it kept advancing from there. You're not going to, I mean, I guess the best way to put it for, for installers would be, let's say you have a giant commercial project and you're given a hundred thousand square feet of space. If you just walked in and you looked at it, it would look a little overwhelming. But as you start laying one square foot after one square foot, piece by piece, you're going to fill it up. And when you get to that last one, you're going to, like you said, you're going to get that dopamine hit. You're going to be like, wow, look what I accomplished. That's right. That's why all good leaders that are, that are doing our, our managing crews, they all set goals every day. Hey, we're going to, we're going to tie out of this line today. Mm Mm-hmm. That's, I mean, it's so funny. You got great, great tile leaders that do that every day on a job site. They wouldn't even dream about not doing it. They, they know that that's how they're supposed to run a job. But for some reason, they can't turn that same discipline on themselves. It's a very interesting thing. And, and um, what I'm challenging people to do is do exactly that. Do exactly that. How far would you tile today? Well, it's the same question. You know, where do you want to play? Hmm. All right, now let's backward. Let's go backwards. How do I get there? You know, it'd be the same thing if you came to me and said, I want to buy a new truck and I want my business to be able to afford it. It's a great, you know, I, I definitely, uh, you know, there's, a, by the way, when concerning habits, uh, another book if, and firing too many books at you guys, but no, another, another <laughs> book. It's just the the basically the bedrock principles of habits are it's called the power of habit. It's one of the most popular books. Matter of fact, everything I've just told you is like really, really common and popular. Um, you know, the Jocko's book is really popular. Mm-hmm. Um, Extreme Ownership. Um, the the power of habit, it's a yellow book, it's got a red red graphics on the cover, but um, you know, excellent book. It's just a just an absolute staple. Getting things done by David Allen. It's a little dated now, um, but I still think it's a principal book that you just I, I just don't see how you can get things done without it. Um, you know, these these things, man, they're they're great. You gotta you gotta take them one step at a time. I mean, honestly, my this podcast it, it serves the purpose of educating other people, but I think long term, as long as I continue to do it, it it may I was talking with Todd Sanders, the CEO of Fleur Force, the other day, and he was like, well, maybe you can start incorporating more of yourself into it. And I've talked about it. Like, I want to own a couple stores, have some crews, have some salespeople, a foreman, somebody doing deliveries. Like, I want this giant machine to run. Like, I don't want to be on the floor forever. I enjoy it, but I want to opt to participate in my business. I want to own an asset. That's what I want to do. Um. Great. So this podcast is kind it, it, as much as I it, this information is for everybody else. Like I, I, I do it because like it wasn't there and I needed the information. So this thing is like a journey, and hopefully, 
over five years, you can watch my mindset change and my business change. And this will all stand as a testament to these things working. So my life would not be where I would am at had I not decided to pick up a book and find podcasts on how to run a business better, how to do better sales, how to do better marketing, how to, whatever it is, like what Ron is telling us is a hundred percent true. You have to make the dedication. You're not going to go lose that 20 pounds without putting in the effort. You can't sleep it away. You can't watch it away. You have to go put in the effort. And if we want to get better at this thing called business or flooring installation, whatever part you want to work on, you need to go do the work. So if you want more money, and I want that for everybody, there's no reason in my opinion that somebody doing flooring installation shouldn't make six figures a year. I think it's absolutely it, you are a if you are a truly skilled laborer, there is no reason you should not be able to make that kind of money. And I don't care if you're working for a store that doesn't have good rates. Go find a different no. store. Yeah, do, do, if if you if you're if you're adding the cocktail, these the money money is secondary. Money is a byproduct. It is not the product. It is a byproduct. Mm-hmm. And if you're exercising your craft and you're doing it holistically with these principles, money will happen to you. It will not. It's not an accident. It, it's it's a byproduct of the work you're doing. And you know, you don't think about dressing a saw blade every day. You just do it because it, it won't cut otherwise. Well, guess what? Your knowledge is very similar. You have to dress your saw blade. You have to do it. It doesn't happen by osmosis. You have to plan it. You have to do it. Here's the beautiful part, too. It gets easier. It's only hard for the first month or so. Mm-hmm. And then you'll then you'll start getting little tidbits, little things that will help you. And then it will become part of a habit. And then you don't have to think about it. And you're on autopilot. And then when you don't do it, you'll miss it. Um, I realize that for a lot of people, that might be that might sound way far away, but it's actually not as bad as you think. About six There's enough. <laughs> that's right. There's really enough great content out there that it's something that you could really start looking forward to. And uh, I, I really enjoy it. I mean, I really enjoy it. Well, you wouldn't and be now, here talking about it otherwise. Like that's the thing yeah. you, you can, I can tell in the conversations that I've had with you, you're, you love doing this. You are very passionate about Absolutely. talking about these kinds of things with other people because you've enjoyed acquiring the knowledge and that you want to share it so other people can have that enjoyment too. Yep. I would do it for free. It just so happens that um, I'm a part of an organization that appreciates what I do and they and they uh, express their appreciation by paying me. So it's I fantastic. can I can get rid of that invoice you sent me over? Yeah, you bet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um on that it's all of this is is so great. Um it's it's it, one it, it's just like I said I love doing this. I love being able to learn. I love being able to get the stuff out there to other people. Um Pick up one of the books, guys and gals. Do yep. I, I pick one? I don't care which one. Um, we're gonna be coming out like the we've. I, I've started the book club in the Floor Academy Facebook group, so I'm picking one book a month. If that's all you do, one book a month. I'm not even telling you to read every day. One book a month. I think this the book for um, April was like twelve and a half hours. You could have done that in the thirty-minute drives to work over two weeks. Yes, they're, they're yes, back. and like, it's and you're picking up slack time. You're making yourself productive in slack time. You could sure you could drive uh, to the job site, and listen to that funny radio show. That's great. Or you can use that time to sharpen your saw. Mm-hmm. That's that's intelligent. That requires a hell of a lot less discipline than. I'm going to wake up early and block out a certain part of my day. Well, and you can do that too, but you, you can, you got to start somewhere. Like if that's going to be the easiest thing. And that's why I tell everyone, lose the music, get some ear pods or earbuds or wireless, whatever, put them in your ear and learn. Well, there they are, man. That's the sound of freedom right there. 
Yep. <laughs> That's an F-35, actually. That was five F-35s, so I apologize for that. <laughs> no, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Go, America. Um, yeah. So pick just you, – you're going to have to sacrifice something, and so I – gave up music i talk about it all the time on the on the podcast like i i don't get me wrong i still listen to my music okay but i gave up listening to it all day every day to be able to do some podcasts and an audio book and things like that and i i've I've said it before if you only maintain 10 percent of everything you listen to you're 10 percent further ahead than the guy that's not listening to it to a thing absolutely that's going to put like time as that yeah. compounds over years and years, where are you going to be compared to the guy that's still sitting at the shop complaining about the cruddy rates with the other guys that are complaining about the cruddy rates when you're doing something to advance yourself? No, you're not going to be at that shop in five years anymore. You're going to be somewhere right. else doing higher end installs, making more money. Yeah. All these, all these things are temporary. You know, and you're in control. I mean, I think that's the bigger part is you're in control. Um, yeah. You got to you got to make that decision to change your mindset at the end of the day. It's it's on you. It's there's nobody to blame for your circumstances but yourself. And I, I mean, maybe that's a different conversation and you didn't have parents or you were abused. But even still, like you can change. You can pick your mindset and change your circumstances. It just might be a little bit harder for you. Yep. I, I, uh, I'm continually looking at our response to, to these things, you know, um, and the people who have figured out how to c- keep themselves moving forward, regardless, mm-hmm. always seem to win. They just always seem to win. It's just, and it, and, and look, they make it look easy, but it's never easy. You just don't see the hours of, of sacrifice. Yep. You don't see what it took. All you see is the product, you know? And, um, I had this conversation, you know, quite, quite often with people, you know, um, I'm not where I am through luck. Luck had nothing to do with it. And, and, um, what people didn't see are the early mornings the late nights, the, the not seeing my family in a lot of cases, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the sacrifice that's required. And so that, that's part of it. And by the way, I wouldn't give it up for, I'm not complaining. I wouldn't give it up for a moment. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it. And I continue to look for ways to do it. Matter of fact, the more sacrifice I can make, generally speaking, the better my life goes. So it's definitely worth it. So all right my friend this is about ready to get loud 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 for an extended period of time okay no i (laughs) we are we are at time i think that's a perfect place to leave it you have got to make sacrifices to get ahead and you get to pick and choose what they are and when they are so that's right you are responsible for your destiny ladies and gentlemen and i want you to get where you want to go so set a goal and start working towards it ron Thank you very much for your time. Do you have anything you want to plug? Can people reach out to you and get a hold of you? What do you got? Hey, for me? look, if you want if you want good online training, go to Latacrete University. Latacrete University is a great place that you can start technical training on all of our products. There you go. There's my plug. Awesome. We got a hundred and fifty some odd trainings in there, and uh, they're great. They're free. Take them. By the way, they're universally applicable in many cases. You don't have to love Laticrete products. They're universally applicable in many cases. So you want to get better at anything from self-leveling to grouting to exterior facade work, it's all in there. There you go. Sure. And they're offering it for free. You don't even got to pay for it. You don't even have to use their Zero products. dollars and zero cents. We're happy to have you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. And I look forward to doing it again. Yep. And by the way, I'm always available. I'm Ron Nash on Facebook, and you'll see me in uh, a group. Uh, the uh, um, Laticrete Inside Track is my personal group, but okay. you'll see me everywhere. Just tag me if you need me. I'm more than happy to help, and certainly I'm happy to have any conversations like these with anybody. I've got a, a well of resources that I'm happy to share with the world. Awesome. Thank you so much again, Ron. I appreciate it, and I'm sure I'll talk with you soon. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. Yep, bye.
That's all the time we have for this week. To keep the conversation going, head on over to the Floor Academy Facebook group. Be sure to subscribe so you can hear each and every episode. We can be found on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, and most major podcast directories. Don't forget to leave a review and let us know what you think about the show. If you would like to be a guest, have questions or feedback, you can email us at FloorAcademyPodcast at gmail.com. You can help support the show by becoming a patron over at www.patreon.com slash Floor Academy. Remember to learn while you earn.